The Corrupting Will Written by Alex Jorgensen and narrated by Jesse Lowther Karkos leaned against the old obsidian rod, feeling the warmth of the velvet wrappings against his skin. Aira, his dear staff, had been with him for so long it had become an extension of his body, feeling almost as natural as any of his four legs. Not so unusual, he thought. After all, he'd had the staff longer than he had had the legs. Karkos had found Aira many centuries past, back when he was still a frail human. He shivered just thinking about that time, when he was so weak, so helpless. It was such a long time ago, he did not even remember his human name. Over the years, the staff had changed him, physically and mentally. It had shown him wonders he had never even known to search for, powers he had never dared dream of. He had grown in size, now standing over seven feet tall, and his body had strengthened, becoming lean and hardened. His legs had shaped into four massive needles, always eerily tapping the ground with a delightful sharp clicking sound. No longer was he the runt. No longer was he afraid. People had learned to fear him, and with Aira in his hand, nothing could stand in his way. Standing atop a half-destroyed watchtower at the outskirts of town, the warlock glared out over the battlefield, carefully examining the fighting. Humans and demons were locked in a frenzied melee in the streets of the ruined city. A cacophonous crash erupted as the demons tore down yet another building to break through the enemy ranks. The Imperium's elite soldiers, known as the Chapter of Light, were holding strong, fighting with an unrivaled ferocity. But they were few in number, and the regular military was heavily outmatched by the powerful demons. They were dying in droves. It seemed impossible that the humans would be able to withstand the invasion much longer. The large demon curled his lips back into a broad grin as he watched Commander Azali tear through yet another line of unlucky foes. The town will fall within the hour he said, with a voice smooth as silk, his tone alluring and seductive. He continued, Let the Herald know. The battle has been won. The Shars Rock Incubus behind him nodded and turned, heading for the void portal to the demon wastes from which they had all emerged a few hours ago. Karkos examined the portal, admiring his own handiwork. It had taken many a sacrifice and drained much of his own energy, but it had been worth it. He had cherished the surprised expression painted on Azali's face when she realized he had transported her entire army directly into the city, behind the enemy's defenses. Impressing her was no small feat, and doing so usually came with even bigger rewards. Karkos sucked air through his nostrils, tasting it. Ah, the smell of blood so invigorates me he said to no one in particular, as he began descending the stairs of his makeshift command post, his long legs clicking against the stonework beneath him. As Karkos exited the tower into a small square, he was met by a large, brutish demon with a gigantic sword resting on his shoulder. The beast bared his pointed teeth in a nasty grin. There you are, Karkos, he smiled sardonically. I was beginning to fear you'd miss the fighting. He stretched his arm out, gesturing to the burning city, and looked at Karkos, a challenge flashing in his eyes. Again, he added. Karkos was almost a head taller, but the massive muscular Gorak still made him feel small, and that annoyed him to no end. He did not like feeling small. "'What do you want, Krakul? the warlock inquired, using his staff to gently push him aside. "'Ah, nothing. The answer is simply nothing. Nothing I've not already taken, that is,' he grinned, that nasty smile still adorning his face. Noticing a few familiar faces in Krakul's demonic entourage, Karkos could feel the rage starting to boil inside him. Don't worry, the monstrous marauder laughed. 
I'll let Azali know of your generous donation to the war. He thrust the giant black sword into the air. Move out, he roared, charging into an empty street towards the center of town, followed by his demonic vanguard. Karkos followed them with his eyes for a brief moment. The primes take you, Krakul, he muttered to himself, deciding to control his anger this time. They'd been bitter rivals since the day Azali forced both of their warbands under her banner. In her own twisted wisdom, she had elevated both to champions of her legion, forcing them to work together. They had quickly become known as Azali's right and left hands. Karkos preferred to think of them more as her brain and ass. He turned to the Sharzrak overseer standing nearby. What's the status? How many did he take? A sudden burst of red clouded his vision, and a jabbing pain stung his temple. The familiar warning signs passed as instantly as they had appeared, jerking him to attention. Ah, oh, what is it? Where? He squealed to the staff as he straightened his back and scanned the area. The overseer, alarmed by the outburst, started swinging his whip, commanding his troops into a battle stance. Before the demons had a chance to organize, they were interrupted by a loud snap, as though the air itself cracked. Followed by a concussive boom, the square burst into a bright, piercing light, momentarily blinding the demons. A dozen bright light beams struck one of the farm buildings nearby in rapid succession. From it burst a group of heavily armored men, brandishing their massive weapons in a pure display of righteous fury. Within seconds, demon blood was flowing thick in the ruined streets and the warriors of the Chapter of Light swarming from the farmhouse now advanced on Karkos's position, fast. Karkos released a primal scream, as much to shake himself of the shock as to intimidate the unexpected enemy forces. He drew back the staff, holding it aloft for a moment. It seems we will have some blood on this day after all he thought, as he unleashed an unholy bolt of pure dark energy. As the projectile reached the closest brother, it slowly wrapped shapelessly around him, swallowing him in darkness. It lifted him from the ground, digging into him as he screamed, crying for help. Within seconds, the dark energy had eroded through the massive golden armor and was digging into the man's skin. Seconds later, the brother had completely dissipated leaving no trace of his existence behind. The staff sent warm, approving pulses through Karkos's body. His lips drew back into a fiendish smile as he turned to face the remaining brothers. Oh, how I've missed this. He swung the staff again, this time releasing a wave of razor-sharp pinth needles. They penetrated three of the brothers' armor, leaving them gurgling on their knees, choking on their own blood. Karkos was laughing uncontrollably as he yet again swung the staff around to ready his third spell. This was almost too easy, and he was starting to make sport of killing in creative ways. This time, let's do something really fun, he proclaimed to the staff as he drove it forward, aiming at one of the brothers charging right for him. From the sapphire stone at the tip of the obsidian rod, a lance of blue and black energy formed, flying directly toward the warrior. As the evil lance was about to impale the brother, he was suddenly launched from his feet and pushed to the side. He came crashing down with a loud metallic clang, a little shaken but seemingly unharmed. The dark energy instead collided with a large golden silhouette. A brilliant flash of light split the lance into a million tiny specks, flickering in the glow as they slowly fell around this newly emerged threat. As the purple smoke from the nether spell evaporated, the sickly green light emanating from the demon portals revealed the form. He wore ancient ornamented gold armor, adorned with a flowing burgundy cape. His face could only belong to a hero, with a jaw so chiseled, the smithing god of the dwarves herself couldn't have done a finer job. There he stood, Kaleth Donhammer, renowned protector of the realms, and ever a problem in these wars. Your terror ends this night, he announced, as he hoisted his massive hammer off the ground and charged at Karkos with long, heavy strides. Karkos quickly regained his composure, lifting Aira into the air and then slamming it into the ground with all his might. 
The ground trembled as a thick, dark smoke shot from the staff, covering the combatants in an instant. For three long breaths he held the staff to the ground, fighting the power emanating from the blue stone. The smoke continued to pour from the staff, suffocating anything in its path. As Karkos finally released the spell, lifting the staff from the ground, he saw the area around him covered in bodies, demon and human alike. All was silent for a moment, and finally Karkos dared breathe freely again. He grunted to himself, satisfied. But you are a wonder, my darling, he said to the staff, as he stared into the blue gem that he liked to imagine was its eye. He felt a familiar sense of satisfaction spread through his body from the staff, letting him know that it, too, was content with the result. Suddenly, one of the bodies gasped for breath. Karkos watched in disbelief as the massive golden armor of Kaleth Donhammer rose from the fallen. Though the warrior's breathing was ragged, he was very much alive, and so very angry. I was sent to rid these lands of evil, and so in the name of the light, I shall remove your black soul, Kaleth Donhammer growled in a hoarse but firm voice. Karkos reared back on his hind legs and desperately swung out with Era, but before he was able to complete this gesture and the deadly spell it would have unleashed, Kaleth struck the staff with his massive hammer, a sharp metal clang piercing the air, knocking Karkos's hand aside with this powerful blow. He then kicked the demon in the chest with his heavy metal boot. Half screaming, half laughing, Karkos fell to the ground. You can't stop me, he sneered incredulously. You can't stop the invasion. I'm more powerful than anything you've ever known. I'll come back. I'll... <clears throat> The air was forced from his lungs, letting out a weak hiss, as Kaleth's boot pressed into his chest, pinning him to the ground. Gasping for breath, Karkos looked defiantly at Kaleth. It's too late, mighty man. Your city has fallen, he taunted mockingly through gritted teeth. Save your breath, dark one. Kaleth had regained his strength, and his voice pierced the air, clear and powerful. You'll meet your filthy creators soon, he continued, and I suspect you shall need all your heinous lies to avoid their torture. For this day, he paused, raising the massive gold-encrusted hammer above his head, the sun somehow at this very moment piercing the dark clouds above, illuminating his golden armor with its radiance. You have failed, he roared as he brought the hammer down, driving it clean through Karkos's skull. With a thunderous crack, it shattered the very stone beneath what little remained of the demon's head. The warlock's demonic body slowly realized that death had taken it as it began to fall apart. First it squirmed wildly, then fell limp, releasing its grasp on the staff. Next, each limb began to liquefy. Finally, it all evaporated into dark mist, leaving only a small puddle of demonic residue behind. As the staff fell to the ground, it transformed into a small wooden stick, made noteworthy only by the blue gem adorning its tip. Caleth stared at it for a moment before bending down to retrieve it. As he lifted it from the ground, it transformed into a large, beautiful sword right before his eyes, encrusted with gold and with a large sapphire adorning the pommel. He felt the sword's sweet temptation reaching into his very soul, silently promising him his every desire. What foul sorcery is this? He said to himself and no one at the same time, as he gazed at the object forming in his hand to perfectly match his armor. Without knowing why, it felt entirely normal to address the sword as he would another living soul. If you think I will wield the same weapon as a fiend of the void, you must be more wicked than he. With that, he tossed the sword into the great chasm formed when the demonic portal had first appeared. As it fell, the sword transformed once again into an innocuous wooden stick with a small sapphire at the tip. It plummeted through the air until finally coming to rest, the tip embedding into the gray dirt deep within the chasm. 
The stick lay stuck in the ground while days passed and the war continued on. Everything was silent, not a soul stirring for miles and miles. Even the wind seemed to have abandoned the wasteland that was once the proud town of Thornbrook. Then one day, someone pulled the stick ever so gently from its resting place. The presence of a living soul stimulated Aero once again. Hungrily, it began latching onto the soul, feasting like a leech on an open wound. This was going to be pure ecstasy. But something was wrong. Aero could not absorb any of its new host's essence. Somehow, this being was completely immune to Aero's invasive prying. How could this be possible? The Great Era felt its will slowly but surely bend to that of its new master. This concludes The Corrupting Will, written by Alex Jorgensen, narrated by Jesse Lowther. Thank you for listening.